Okay. Good morning, everyone, and welcome. It's great to have you all join us uh, for today's coffee break. We have just a few announcements uh, that we'll get started with before we uh, move on to the coffee break. So first of all, thank you to all of our supporters and volunteers that keep our programs going to protect the life and lands in the Sky Island region. Uh, we definitely couldn't do it without all of you, so thank you, thank you so much. Um, throughout the presentation this morning, please feel free to type any questions into the chat box that you can find at the bottom of the Zoom window, and we'll have a question and answer section at the end that we'll be able to address all of those. Uh, we're continuing to hold coffee breaks every other Thursday morning. I know a lot of you are now regulars at our, at our coffee breaks, which we're, we're always happy to see. If you did miss any of our previous coffee breaks, we do record all of them and you can view them on our website. And in the chat box right now, we'll be posting the link to see those previously recorded coffee breaks. And our next coffee break coming up will be at the end of the month um, on Thursday, October 29th. And we'll be hearing exciting stories from Mario Ciret Galan about working in conservation in Mexico, um, including all sorts of wildlife encounters and navigating field work with the cartel. So that'll be a really, uh, a really fun coffee break. We hope you can attend. Registration will be available soon. You can find that out on our website. Today, we would also like to announce um, the Desert Visions Photography Contest that begins today, October 15th. Um, so this is a really fun opportunity where you can post photos that capture the desert, however you experience it in terms of wildlife, plants, people, whatever it may be, whatever speaks to you, on your Instagram or Facebook accounts. And you can tag and follow uh, Sky Island Alliance and Aram, which is a new desert footwear company. Um, and this will help earn donations for our Spring Secret program and our water program. Uh, so you can post as many photos as you'd like between now and the end of the month. Uh, so check out our website and in the chat box there, we have a link for you to read more about the contest, but it'll be really fun to share photos and see beautiful photos uh, of the region from other people as well. So today's coffee break uh, is to introduce our newest project from our wildlife program here at Sky Island. And um, we're, we're really excited about it. So we'll cover the basics of our of photofauna, the new project, how you can participate um, and then we'll have a live walkthrough of actually going through the process and completing the wildlife checklist. And then we'll conclude with questions. So as I said before, feel free to type questions as we go along and we'll address them at the end. Um, this coffee break will be recorded as well if you do wanna go back for reference. And we also have a whole website, uh, a web page on our website dedicated to photofauna where you can read a lot more detailed information and all about the species that we'll be introducing today. So there's a link to that in our chat box as well. So photofauna. The goal of photofauna is to build a larger network of wildlife cameras by observing the seasonal movements of Sky Island species on both sides in the US and in Mexico. Using wildlife cameras is not new to us. And as many of you know, we have a lot of existing cameras in the region uh, now and, and in the past as well that have been helping us monitor wildlife. So we do wanna give a special shout out um, to everyone who has helped contribute to the Sky Island Wildlife Monitoring Network over the past. And currently here, I just put up a map of where we have some of these cameras. So you can see we, we are getting to a lot of the mountain ranges here, but we're really excited to build upon this and get to even more spots. Um, and there, uh, as I said, we've had tons of volunteers over the years. These are a few of our really, really dedicated current volunteers who continue to check cameras um, five times a year during the different seasons in, in the region. So thank you to all of you. And it's with a lot of gratitude that we welcome uh, you to continue monitoring and transition to the photofauna project. Um, so as I said, this is an effort to greatly expand the early network that we've had into a truly bi-national monitoring network that will collect data from all of our existing remote cameras and then partner with other conservation organizations that have wildlife cameras in the region and now extend to backyard camera users as well. Um, so we've uh, already come up with a list of, of really great partners that will be working with us on the Photofauna project. Um, here's a list of our, uh, some of our first partners um, that do already have wildlife cameras up and are excited to share data and be able to have a broader monitoring network. 
Um, we have invitations out to other conservation organizations in the region, in the region that have cameras and others that um, would like to add cameras. So we're really, really excited to welcome all of these partners uh, to the project. So with all of that in mind, you might ask, what exactly is photofauna that I keep talking about? Um, so it's simple. It's a network of wildlife cameras across the Sky Island region. And um, you can participate by setting up a wildlife camera, be that um, in your backyard or if you have access to a more remote area, a ranch or some sort of personal property that you can put up a camera. Um, you'll observe species that are present on the camera and you'll collect data in one month intervals of the presence or the absence of the species from the species checklist. And then once a month, at the end of the month, you'll submit an online monthly photofauna checklist. So that's a brief overview. We're going to dig into this a lot, uh, a lot deeper today so we can see how this will actually work. And again, um, the point of fauna, fauna is to help us and our partners study when and where wildlife is present seasonally so that we can better protect their habitats and pathways. So we've come up with a, um, a list for our uh, online checklist, the monthly checklist of a lot of species. Um, so we would love to monitor all of, the sky, all of the species in the Skyland region, but a checklist like that would have over 100 species and we fear we would lose a lot of interest <laughs> um, and feasibility. So we've had to carefully, carefully choose the checklist species, um, which we've chosen for specific regions. And we've split these, uh, these species into six different groups. So the first one here on the left you'll see is migratory species. So this group of species will help us monitor seasonal changes. In the photo uh, you'll see there from a, um, a camera we have up is an elf owl. And we'll also be looking for the presence of lesser longnose bats, turkey vultures, and gray hawks. On the right, you'll see uh, our next group, the urban adapted species. This group of species are indicative of species that live near development or urban areas. Um, and so here we'll have the bobcat, as you can see in the photo, coyotes, greater roadrunners, desert cottontails, and striped skunks. Next up, we'll have endemic species, uh, which is a group of species that are unique to the Sky Island region. So there from a backyard photo, you'll see a Gila monster. And we'll also be looking for the presence of antelope jackrabbits and gold turkeys. On the right, our next group are wide ranging species, which are important um, to see those species that need habitat connection between the different Sky Island mountain ranges. Uh, so in the photo there, you'll see a pronghorn from one of our cameras. And we'll also be looking for the presence of mountain lions, black bears, mule deer, and white, white tailed deers. We'll be looking for uh, subtropical species. So these group of species are really important because uh, we're right at the northern limit of their range. Uh, so there from one of our cameras, you'll see a white-nosed coati. We'll also be looking for javelinas, North Mex Mexican Virginia opossums, hooded skunks, and hognose skunks. And finally, we'll be looking for those species that are sensitive to development. Um, and these are those that need undeveloped open space to thrive. Uh, so here in the photo from a backyard camera, you'll see the American badger, and we'll also be looking for ringtails and western spotted skunks. So this list of species is what we've, after a lot of deliberation, decided on. Um, there could be a uh, change over time. We'll reassess this at the end of the year when we see what sort of species people have detected. And we have a spot in the checklist to also upload any other photos, um, if you see presence of other very interesting species or um, species that you continue to see that might be important uh, for us to monitor. And we'll pay special attention to that category. And if we continue to see a species brought up enough and in, um, the case is strong enough, we may add that to the uh, checklist as well. But as I said, we do want to keep the survey efficient, which is why we've limited the number of species for now. So now I'll pass this over to Megan Bethel, our wildlife biologist, who is going to talk a little bit more about how to get your camera up and running and really dive in uh, to photofauna. All right, hello everyone. I just wanna go over a quick overview of the uh, whole process and where you can find it on our website. There we go. So to start, you wanna set up your camera. 
If you don't already have a wildlife camera, you can acquire one at trailcampro.com. That's where we buy all of our wildlife cameras. And we have a discount code available. Um, just email Zoe to get the code and learn more. We also have a blog post of learning uh, where you can learn how to pick the best camera for you. So Zoe will be posting that in the chat right now. After you get your camera, you want to be able to set it up. And we request you put it on your own property. It could be a rural ranch or it could be a urban backyard. Anywhere will work, but please do not trespass on other people's property. So once you have a good spot in mind, you have to think of where the animals are. So look for trails, tracks, if you see a physical animal, uh, try to place it where you think the animals will be. And usually place it around the animal height, so like three to four feet or lower if you think you have smaller animals. Also, if you're worried about security, I recommend get, investing in a security bear box. There are these steel boxes you can see on the left and they help protect your cameras from theft and animal damage. And we have a lot of great blog posts on our website of how to set up a camera and how to check them if you want some more detailed instructions. We even have a couple of copy breaks about it. So the most exciting part of uh, doing any wildlife camera data is collecting the photos. Uh, once you have your camera out, we recommend leaving it there for about a month, but you can have it out for longer or you can check it every couple days if you're curious, if you can get access. Once you're there, uh, we recommend you swap out the SD cards for continuous data and check the camera batteries. You don't want to miss anything cool because your camera is dead. Once you have that, just bring your SD card home and plug it into a computer or SD card reader and look through your photos. This is like Christmas sometimes, you need to see all the awesome wildlife that might come through. Make sure you watch for animals and check all the blank photos carefully because there might be something working in the background. And keep track of the species that occur, especially the ones on our checklist. For our survey, we will require one photo of each species just to verify identification. So we'll have some recommendations on how to keep track of that. So a large part of using wildlife cameras is photo management. Uh, everyone will have their own system but having a well-organized photo database is essential or else you'll go crazy. So as I said, everyone will have their own way of doing it, but this is how we recommend sorting photos uh, for photo fauna. So the first step is to sort out all the blanks. Uh, you might have none depending on your location or you might have thousands of grass photos, it really depends. But moving them out will help keep things simpler. And then after that, we, recommend making a subfolder within that photo data just for photo fauna pictures. And you can copy and paste one picture per species into that folder. That way you don't have to keep scrolling and scrolling and looking. Also, you can rename each of your files as that species. And that's for your own reference. Um, you don't really need that, but it helps keep everything organized and straight. So you can see on the left, there are a couple examples of how I've done it in the past. And often video or wildlife cameras can record video and get great behavior. Um, if your camera does that, just take a screenshot of that photo when the animal's best in view, and you can submit that screenshot. That'll work as a photo. So once you have all your camera or photos organized, all your species identified, it's time to start submitting it to the uh, web website. So Zoe linked it earlier in the chat, um, the photo fauna webpage. You also can find it on our website, scottislandalliance.org, under what we do, conserving wildlife, and the Scott Island photo fauna subpage. And on this webpage, we'll have the link to the survey, the project overview, a getting starting guide, uh, kind of what we explained earlier, as well as a gallery of all the species in our checklist if you want to have a visual reference. We also have a really robust FAQ section, which, which will hopefully answer a lot of questions and has a lot of good information in it. So once you navigate to the survey on that link, um, it'll take you to a survey one, two, three webpage. And we hopefully have it lined up so it's pretty simple. And we want one survey per month and per camera. So if you have mul multiple months of data, we recommend, um, please recommend uh, submitting one survey per month. 
maybe have multiple cameras do multiple surveys for, for the price. And for our survey, we'll be asking the submitters information. And that's for Scott Island's own reference. If there's any issues, we can contact you. But private information will not be shared. We'll also be uh, asking about the camera information. And that includes the month you're submitting the data and the location of the camera. And we recommend entering them as lat long coordinates on this little uh, map feature in the survey. And locations will not be shared uh, within a certain radius and it will not be linked to any personal information. This is for, uh, to get a range, but not, not to share any information. And then the next part of the checklist is the species list. And that's the longest part of the section. And it's broken up into those categories to make things a little simpler. And we, uh, all you need to do is just click yes if you've seen it, or leave it as no if you didn't. If you click yes, it'll ask you to upload those photos. So that's where being organized will really make these things uh, go a lot faster. And additionally, there is some, a, a place to add more photos, notes, and any other cool things you might have seen on the camera. And one last part about photo permission, just to see if you have permission to use your photos and how you would like to be credited. So once all this data starts coming in, uh, we can ask a lot of interesting questions. This is some preliminary data that's come in from our partners and some test surveys. And this is only for Havelina, but we can get a lot of cool maps of where they are and where they're not, and as well as all the photos everyone will be submitting of all the different individual photos. And through this data over time, as more and more photos will be added, we can ask a lot of different questions uh, for each of these type of species categories. For example, like how far into urban areas will animals permeate, like those adapted coyotes and bobcats. And then on the other hand, what are the current range limits of the true endemic species like the antelope jackrabbit? What if we detect one outside of its range? That would be really interesting. Also for subtropical species like the Mexican opossum, it's, uh, Scotland region is the farthest north it's been detected. And we wanna see how that range will change over time and how does climate change and the border wall barriers impact it, and impact its range. And also for animals that are sensitive to development, like the badger, how do new urban developments affect its presence and absence in the area? And there's dozens of more questions that this data can help answer to protect these animals and their habitat. Also, besides those cool scientific uh, questions, we also have a photo contest. By allowing SIA to use your uh, photos, you'll be eligible for our photo contests. And that's an option in the survey where you can check yes or no. But our first contest is going to be the best of 2020. And all photos submitted by December 11th uh, will be eligible. And then we're excited to say on December 17th, we'll have a live coffee break where people can vote for their favorite photo. It'll be really interactive, so you don't want to miss it. It'll be a great way to see some cool animals from across the region. But there's also a lot of different additional ways to get involved. Say, for example, you want to have a camera on your property, but you don't have time to do the checks or look at the photos. We can join a team. Or if you just want to do field checks or you just want to look at photos, um, contact Zoe and she will help set you up with uh, a group of people who can work together if you want to break up the, the job a little bit. Also, you can help sponsor a wildlife camera. I, there's a will be, there will be a donation link in the chat, and all the money uh, uh, donated will help support getting wildlife cameras to people who can't afford them. So any help will be appreciated. So now we'll transition to Emily Burns. She is our expert on doing the survey right now, and she'll walk through some specifics and give tips and tricks on how to actually enter the survey data. I'll transition to Emily now. Okay, great. All right, hello everyone. Um, I'm really passionate about this project. I have four wildlife camera points around my own house and I've enjoyed figuring out what works well and some tips and tricks for completing the checklist by using my own camera data. So what I wanted to do this morning was to actually show you some of the steps that I go through in order to go through the checklist without having to search around for a lot of photos or data. 
And I wanted to start by saying one of the things that I do is I keep um, a document file open that has the information that I can just copy and paste into the survey. Because I have four different cameras, I want to make sure that I have the correct location information for my camera that I'm going to upload for a single survey checklist. So th this example, I just have a text edit file open. It says my camera name, the month that I'm going to submit. Of course, I won't forget my own name, <laughs> but a phone number and then the location and latitude and longitude. And I wanted to show you um, how you can get that. So there's several ways that you can enter in your location information. What we want you to do is try to be as accurate as you possibly can and pinpointing where your specific camera is. This is going to help us in the future when we're trying to analyze the locations of animals and their species range relative to things like highways or new development. We do need that precise location. However, as Megan said, we are not going to reveal the exact location of your camera point to protect your camera, your privacy, and uh, we don't want to reveal the exact locations of these animal species as well. So in any mapped products coming out of the project will obscure the, the location. Okay, so I'm going to show you how I got this latitude and longitude by just using Google Maps. So as an example, in Google Maps, you can type in an address. So if this is a backyard camera, you can type in an address and you'll see it pop up right away. But let's say your street address or where Google registers um, your home is actually not the precise location of your camera. You can choose a different point. So what I did here is I, I, had, I put in our office as an example. And let's say our camera was actually located on the west side of the building. If I just click in Google Maps, a little window will pop up at the bottom that lists the coordinates. And th that's the information that then you can copy over into a Word document, a notebook or something, and then just type it in. So let's see, I'll, I'll update this, seven, zero, get those right numbers. Okay, I haven't figured out how you can actually copy from this window in Google. So I just actually hand type it in. Then I've got my location. And I will copy this over when it's time for me to um, enter that into the checklist. All right. Okay, so as Megan mentioned, on our Photofauna webpage, there's a link to the survey. You click on that, and it opens up the ArcGIS uh, Survey 123 window. You don't need to be logged into this. You can visit it fresh every time. What I recommend doing is just bookmarking it in your browser so that every month when you come back, you can just go right to the survey page. There's four pages to the survey, and the first one is simply a welcome. So you can go ahead and click to the next page. The second page asks information about you, um, your contact information, and some information about the camera. Now, this information, as Megan said, is only for us to be able to contact you if we have questions about your data entry, um, if we need any supplemental information about your camera location, and also to let you know if you're a big winner in our, in our photography contest. So you definitely want to have your contact information in here. We will try to reach you by uh, email first. Okay, so that's the contact information. Then we move on to the camera information. So a really important thing here to make sure that the data you're entering is accurate is you want to select the right month and year that you'll be submitting the checklist and the corresponding photos for. So in this example, I'm going to be uploading data from September 2020. The survey is asking you if you've monitored for the entire month. The goal of this project is to have a complete checklist so that the camera is operating the entire month without any failures, so that we know that in front of that camera, yes, we had those species or no, they were completely absent. If you did have a, a problem with your camera and the date and it stopped running at a certain part of the month, you could select no, and then you'll have an option to enter in the longest stretch of days that your camera is actually operating that month. But hopefully you've been able to maintain your camera, your cameras haven't died, and yes, you're submitting a complete checklist. Okay. The next thing is the location of the camera. And this is where you have multiple options to find your location. 
um, if you if your camera is right on your house and you just want to type in your address, you could do that right here. Um, so, oops. Um, this was one way to do it. Tucson. Okay, that's the Sky Island office and it pops up. But remember, I was feeling like, no, I actually um, want to use a more accurate location. So I have the latitude and longitude that I got in a separate Google map window. So if you have that, you could alternatively just paste in those coordinates. And when you hit enter, you'll see that the, the blue indicator moves slightly west. You also, in the map, can use this map to select your location and you could navigate around um, and find it. That may or may not be very accurate for you. I think if you can recognize your point on the map really closely and zoom in enough, that would work. But I recommend spending time on Google Maps separately to get the latitude and longitude because you can use different layers. You could use a satellite um, layer to make sure that you're right next to that Palo Verde tree, for example, when you're finding your location. Um, once you've entered it in, um, you'll see it pop up here in the map. And that's the coordinate that will be logged with your individual survey. The nice thing about recording it in a separate text file is for the next month, when you go ahead and enter in your next checklist for the same camera, you can copy and paste and use the same latitude and longitude. The last question that we ask on every survey about the camera um, is about whether there is the presence of water that animals could drink. What we want to understand is if water could be available within about 50 feet of the camera for at least part of the month. Water, especially in our arid Sky Island region, is incredibly important for wildlife and may be a reason why you're detecting certain species in front of your camera. So what we want to know, and it doesn't matter what the water source is. For me, I have a, water, a bowl of water that I actually put out for wildlife, or it could be a natural source that may be only wet for part of the month. Even if there's water available for just a couple of days, we would still want you to indicate yes. Okay, with that, we're ready to do our checklist and we move on to page three. As Megan explained, all of the species are categorized into their particular subsection. And the survey starts with the subtropical species. At the top of the window, you can see all of the ones um, that we have on, this, on the checklist today. The default in the survey is no. So you don't actually have to change toggle yes or no unless you actually have a positive detection of one of the species on the checklist. So I'm doing this for September for my water bowl camera and I did not have a hognose skunk. In fact, I've never seen one on my, on my camera here, but I did have a hooded skunk. So when I select yes, then the survey changes and you see a pop-up window for you to select your image file. When I select that, um, it's bringing up my, my browser window with all of the files on my computer. And I have a folder where I have compiled all of the images that I'm uploading into a photo fauna called my photo fauna home folder. I'm going to do um, September and I organize my files just this, you can do it your own way, but this is what I do by year and then month. So this is my September folder. I have four cameras. I'm gonna to choose to do the bull camera. And this is just for my own organization. After I've completed a checklist, I change the title of my folder to submitted to make sure I don't get confused of which ones I've already uploaded. So I click onto my bull camera and here are all the, the, uh, the images that I've assembled to upload into the survey. I go to hooded skunk. Yep, I can see it. There it is, super cute and I can, very tiny, but I can actually verify that yes, the date is correct. It was during September. So I just select it and it pops up here. Now it is not actually uploaded to the survey yet. So that's one of the important things. You can see that it knows which one to grab for the survey, but until you actually submit your checklist, your photos are not going to be uploaded. So if you were to partially do a checklist and then close your browser window, window none of the, those data and the photographs won't have been submitted to the project yet. Okay, so we keep going here. Yes, I had javelina. So I'm gonna find it. 
The nice thing is the computer is pretty smart. It remembers the last folder that I accessed. So I can just now select my Havelina photo. Sadly, I haven't had an opossum or kawadi. Okay, so for endemics to the region, um, in September, I didn't have any of these species by my water bowl camera. So I can move on to the wide ranging species. These are the typically larger um, animals, pretty notable if you have a mountain lion on your home camera, I would say. <laughs> I didn't have any of these species, so I'll just leave the checklist as it is with the default no. Pardon my scrolling, we get down here to the migratory species. Now, I do occasionally get an alf owl. I can't remember if I had one for September, so I'm gonna to refer to my folder and see if I have an alf owl photo. Nope, I didn't. I didn't have an alf owl, I, but I did have one for October. So sometimes it's hard to remember exactly which one you have for which month. So you can always refer to a well-organized folder. So I'm going to cancel that and go back and say, nope, actually, never mind. I didn't have an alf owl. And I didn't have the gray hawk, lesser long-nosed bat, or turkey vulture. These even if you're surprised we have these on the list, all of these species are ones that actually do show up on these wildlife cameras. So um, every species we've included, we know we've detected on our own wildlife cameras, at least at some place in the Sky Island region. Okay, we've got a few categories left. Species sensitive to development, American badger, ringtail, and western spotted skunk. Well, I certainly have a family of badgers around my house. So we do have a badger photo here to upload. There it is, super bright eyes. Gotta love the stripe along the back. <laughs> okay, but no ringtail and no spotted skunk. Now the last category is the one where I think most of us will have the most uh, detections every month to upload. And this is a longer list. Um, Bobcat, Cooper's Hawk, Coyote, Desert Cottontail, Gamble's Quail, Greater Roadrunner, Gray Fox, and Striped Skunk. Now I don't have all of these species, but I've got a number of them. So I'm gonna start with Bobcat. Select my Bobcat photo. Look at that cutie. Haven't yet had a Cooper's Hawk on the camera. I'm really waiting for it to come down for a drink. So that's a no. Did have coyote. This was actually a pup. I've watched this pup grow up over the summer. It's been really fun. Desert cottontail. Absolutely had lots of those. There's a pair hopping around the water bowl. Almost to the end here. Gamble's quail. Okay, and then lastly, I think for my checklist, I have the Greater Roadrunner. Nice glamour shot of these fast birds. <laughs> okay, great. I've gone through my checklist and now I can go on to the final page. The last information is about if there's any other notable species you would like to submit. We haven't explicitly included any listed or endangered species. So I guess I would say if you do see a jaguar or an ocelot, we'd really love to know. <laughs> You're welcome to include that. If you select yes, that you want to uh, share another species that you think is interesting for the checklist, maybe it's a migratory bird species that we don't have on the list, you can select yes, upload a file. You can upload as, up to 10 different images if you'd like to. And then please include any caption information or inf what you would like us to know about the species you're adding to your checklist. Um, you also, the last question and an opportunity for you to add more photos. Uh, do you have any more photos you want to submit? Often I find animals doing really funny things in front of the cameras and I want to share them with Sky Island Alliance. So, and it's partners. So I keep a folder of just funny screenshots that I have um, some badgers. There's a badger taking a bath. I had a bobcat kitten walk by the camera, which was really wonderful. Um, a cottontail taking a selfie, just as examples of things you can show. Um, and a smiling hooded skunk. So all of these I'm going to submit and all of these photos are eligible to be part of the 
the photo competition. So think about your best glamour shots that you want to contribute. And you'll see the images pop up there. Okay. Now, what's important to us is for us to understand whether we have permission to use your images in photophonic communications. We will be compiling the photographs together to explain the distribution and communicate with the public about where we're finding species on the checklist. And we also would like to show the photos that are part of the photography competitions. So if you select yes, you'll be eligible to be, you, um, your photos to be in, used in, for this way. And you can type in how you want your photo credit to be given. It could be your name, your initials, whatever you'd like. And if you don't want to provide any um, photo credit information, you can leave that blank. Any other um, notes you want to let us know about um, your photographs, um, please, please let us know in this text, this last text uh, box. What we will say is we're not going to reveal the location of the, where the photos come from, and they won't be attributed um, to your location. So the only attribution to your photo would be what you put in the photo credit section, and we will be cropping off the information bar that's often stamped on top of photographs, just to make sure we're, we're removing any of the um, confidential information. You get to add any final notes you want to share about your month of observation, especially if there's something really strange, you saw an animal you never saw before, anything you might think we should be aware of about wildlife around your camera, please let us know here. And um, then it can be time to submit your, your survey. Now, Megan Bethel's contact information, her email is listed here. This, she can help you if you're really stuck on, a, on an identification of one of the photos or images from your camera during a month. We also recommend you submit if you're unsure how to recognize species on your camera to iNaturalist first to help crowdsource which skunk species you have, for example, before you submit. We will be carefully going through every submission to make sure that the photo is actually the species corresponding to the checklist. And Megan will be in touch with you if she has any questions about your identifications. So with that, you click submit. And depending on the speed of your internet, this could be quick or it could take up to a couple of minutes and you just want to leave your browser window sitting there. You can see here that um, this survey is uploading 13 photos and it hung up for a second and now it's quickly catching up. Wait until it completely uploads and then it will switch to a final screen. After you've finished submitting and this checklist was sent successfully, if you realize that you made a mistake, let's say you accidentally had the wrong photo in a folder and you just went through quickly and uploaded each species, if you realize you did that, I did that yesterday, I sent a panicked email to Megan, you don't need to panic, <laughs> and she can actually on the back end go in and edit anything. She can replace photos or remove a species from a checklist if it wasn't supposed to be there for that month. So you can directly reach out to Megan if you have any questions or concerns about your submission. And with that, that's the whole Sky Island checklist. It actually only takes me a couple of minutes to do it when I have all my photos well organized and the location information ready to copy and paste into the survey. Thanks. Thanks, Emily, uh, for walking us through that. Um, so now we're going to open it up to some questions. I think some have already been coming in uh, through the chat box, but if people want to take a minute to add any other questions they have after they've seen the actual Odopana uh, survey checklist, please feel free to do that. I'm just going to summarize a few questions that came in earlier that were answered. Um, and the first one was from Olivia about getting Cooper's hawks and how the best way to get them on camera. And from my experience, a lot of the raptors are seen at water, at water. So if you have a water bowl or a pool or just some sprinklers, that's where they usually get picked up on camera. Um, you have a bird bath that gets them a lot on camera too. And the same, she also had a question about raccoons and they're not on the list, but they're an urban adapted species. And we'll, at the end of the year, we'll look at those additional species again and consider if we should add it to the survey. So it might come up soon. But same with other, any other animals that might be worth monitoring. Uh, another question from Robert and a few other people was submitting data from the past. And you can do that 
At the beginning of the survey, there is a section where you can select the month and the year. And if you just navigate back on the little calendar, you can select which month and year. And it's great if you have six years of data, that'd be awesome if you submit that. So thank you. That's all the questions so far. So if anyone else has any more, feel free to add them in the chat. I have a question about the Nest video camera. Emily, you have one. Do you want to address that? Oh, sure. Can you just read out the, the question? Yes. Uh, her Nest video camera isn't as clear as the photos we just saw. Mm -hmm. I have a Nest as well, um, and I have one paired with another camera. So what I would say is, as long as it's recognizable um, what the animal is in it, it's fine to take a screen capture of one of the videos and you can have the you can have the timestamp still in it which could be helpful um, so you'll just have to probably keep better records about your images and the day that it comes from because it doesn't have the same date and timestamp that a traditional wildlife camera has um, but it should work it should work fine as long as you label your your photos really well um, what i typically do i only collect videos from all of my cameras and so I look at the video, I pause it as Megan suggested, when the animal is clearest or most recognizable, I take a screenshot and I label that, that image. So it's a, usually a PNG file. Um, so that seems to be working for me all right. All right, so another question that came in is how far west is our interest area? Well, this is a collaborative effort across multiple nonprofits that are interested in a variety of wildlife conservation questions. So the core of the Sky Island region, which is half in Sonora and half in um, southeastern Arizona and just a very little bit of New Mexico, is sort of the, the core, the heart of this project. But many of these species, excluding the maybe the endemic species, are have much wider ranges. And so we are open to having data so outside of the traditional Sky Island region, that could be very helpful in context um, setting for as we're looking at patterns in wildlife occupancy and movements over the landscape. So I'm not going to say there's a point that we're not interested in. We definitely have a lot of gaps in our understanding within the Sky Island region. So that we're going to be focusing primarily in adding cameras there. But like I said, we're open to much broader data as well. Another good question that came in, uh, hopefully Emily, you can answer it, is do the cameras have to be in the same spot, in the same location all month? And can the cameras be moved close by uh, to different areas to detect different species? We've, we've had a lot of questions about this. And um, typically what we do in our wildlife research is we do maintain cameras in single locations. We do make placement adjustments if we realize we're missing the game trail, we have the wrong perspective, we need to shift it slightly to a different tree to truly get the space where animals are moving through. But the longer you're able to keep the camera in one location, the better you are to actually detect the true species diversity list for that spot. So often um, we want to cover a really large area and it, it does one, one thing that people often want to do is to keep moving their cameras around. You'll be better served by having your cameras regularly spaced out and leaving them there. It may take more months for one species to walk through, but over time you will. We've been generating these species accumulation curves from our cameras, and it may take a few months to a year or even two for less common species to walk by a camera point. But the more stationary they are, the better you're able to detect changes over time. It just adds a lot of confounding factors if we keep moving cameras around. So what for our project for Photofauna, our requirement is a camera needs to be stationary for the 30, uh, 30 or 31 days, that particular month that you're submitting. If you were to do a month in one location and then move the camera to another location for a different checklist and month, that's fine. We would use those as two separate months worth of data, but they wouldn't be used as a, any kind of time study to look at how changes in that location um, occur over time. So a minimum is one month 
in order to be submitted to the study. Great, thank you, Emily. We also had an interesting question um, from Darsha. She has uh, two chickens and two ducks that might be considered a like a attractant or a lure uh, for coyotes and other urban adapted um, animals. And I kind of want to address that um, of does that we don't recommend anyone baiting the cameras to lure animals in, but I feel like that's kind of unavoidable if you have your own pets and livestock. So I would recommend in the initial notes section, just write down if you have like game birds or chickens nearby that might be a, an attractant that you can't get rid of. And if you have other areas, like you mentioned, Darsha, maybe consider putting your camera there instead of by the chickens, just to make sure that they're not there for the chickens. <laughs> That's an interesting thing of having urban adapted carnivores. You have to live with them. Right, that, that's a great point, Megan. Um, what our plan is, is to work with all of the collaborating conservation organizations that are participating in Photofauna to figure out what additional questions we're going to have for all of you about camera locations. And every month, the only thing we're asking you is their water present, because it's hard to remember, especially for ephemeral water sources, whether it was wet or not, um, far in the, in the, you know, if it's in the distant past when you're entering your data. Um, but we will be reaching out and using your contact information to send you a supplemental survey once or twice a year to ask questions um, about other variables that could be affecting uh, what types of species are coming by your camera. And that one in particular, uh, is there the presence of, of livestock or um, game birds? That would be a great question. Do you have bird feeders? And those are variables that when we're doing our spatial analysis to understand patterns of wildlife will be really critical for understanding, oh, that's why you've got, <laughs> that's why you've got so many coyotes coming around. Um, so we will follow up with you, but we won't be doing that for the first few months. So like